So welcome to the Exceed MPI workshop. I'm John Urbana coming to you from Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. This is uh, the workshop that uh, most uh, excites me as a parallel programmer because this is the most powerful of all the parallel programming techniques. Kind of overall far 50,000 foot view, I think that's what I call it here in this first slide here, a 50,000 foot view of the parallel computing landscape. So that when I talk about things, they kind of relate to other things. And so we're, we're going to cover a lot of that stuff. We're going to cover all the jargons and buzzword now, uh, put everything together in that sense, so that when we start diving into the actual coding later on, I'll be able to make a lot of references to things and you'll understand why things are done that particular way, why things have to be done that way. It won't just all be mysterious uh, decisions made by the MPI uh, you know, developers. And uh, so we'll do all of that. And then we're going to dive into to, to programming. And by the time we're done with this afternoon, you'll already be, you will be a parallel programmer. And that means by tomorrow afternoon, we can have an outro talk knowing that you're an actual parallel programmer and we can really compare what we've done to some other software approaches because there are many ways to do parallel programming. And you're going to find out why uh, we picked MPI here, why MPI is so dominant. It, it is very safe to say that MPI is the dominant way to do uh, serious parallel programming. And you'll, you'll find out uh, why that is, and we can have a, a meaningful comparison to other parallel programming uh, techniques once you're an MPI programmer. Uh, so that's kind of the, the general plan here. So I won't give you a, a whole lot of examples of parallel programs and how important they are. I could go on literally for hours with just projects that I've been involved in uh, over the years, um, but I won't because Many of you are coming here with your own motivations already. Uh, you've, you've got projects that you would like to parallelize. And uh, otherwise, you just pay attention. If you read science or nature or any journal that's in your field, you see that most simulation these days that's leading edge, that's publication quality in the sciences is being done with some version of parallel computing or another. Uh, you know, very, very little public, public publication quality science is being done on laptops. Uh, so I won't go into a lot of, but I'll point out a few very, you know, just basic ones to give you some idea. Um, and I'll pick some obviously important ones like climate change analysis. I think we all probably appreciate the importance of climate change modeling uh, these days. Uh, and climate change analysis is basically like trying to do weather prediction, which is already a computationally difficult problem. Um, but you're trying to do weather prediction over a period of decades. And you're not just trying to do it for your neighborhood. You're trying to do it for the entire planet. So it's very easy to understand how that can be a computationally difficult problem. And indeed, uh, many of the world's largest computing platforms are, if not dedicated to climate modeling, have that as an extremely uh, important application that they support. Uh, but on a smaller scale, you can have things like uh, combustion modeling, where you're just trying to model uh, how combustion happens in a piston uh, of a single car, a single piston of a car engine, uh, or maybe in a power turbine. Uh, these things are all done these days on computers. You know, they don't. Don't, don't do trial and error in laboratories trying to develop a turbine blade. Uh, so this level of simulation is also extremely computationally intensive, even though it's not the size of the globe and it might be something as small as you know a dozen centimeters across because do fluid flow, fluid dynamics is uh, chaotic and turbulent. It requires incredible computational intensity to, to model uh, accurately, especially multi-physics things that involve chemistry and thermodynamics in funny ways at the same time. So these applications are all done on supercomputers these days and very, very parallel if you wanna do any, any work that's leading edge there. Uh, and just to give you one other one that's very, very different, um, doing brain simulation modeling uh, is uh, something that requires large scale parallel computing, not only because the brain is inherently very parallel, something to appreciate a lot if you come to one of our machine learning or AI workshops, but, uh, but because the brain is so huge, a human brain has uh, many billions of neurons and trillions of synapses in it. So trying to model any substantial fraction of the brain requires a huge parallel computer. So this stuff is all parallel computing. And again, we could go on for uh, many hours. I've got an appendix, as a matter of fact, with lots of parallel computing applications, but we won't spend our time there. Although I encourage doing Q&A sessions if you have questions about applications that interest you, I'd be delighted to talk about things that uh, I have some knowledge of. Uh, more to the point though, is the fact that uh, doing laptop serial computing is really just these days, it's, it's almost moot if you want to do anything that's interesting or scientific. Uh, I, there's a very good book that I use in my computational physics class, a semester-based course that I teach here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Mark Newman writes a book, we use it in the class. It's a Python-based book and uh, it's a Python-based class. And in that class, in the, in the book, uh, there are many, many different algorithms of various sorts that we teach uh, beginners, people that are new to numerical methods. Uh, 
and uh, they learn how to do them. But the caution is always made in the book that you really don't want to try to run any of these things, uh, on, you know, with with Python codes on your laptop type of environment that take uh, more than about a billion operations. It's, it's obviously a rough approximation, a rule of thumb, but it's a pretty good one. You know, so, so we can encourage our students not to try to scale up a, a simulation or a finite element mesh or something too large to where they can't get anything done. So you've got to keep your ambitions pretty low, a billion operations or less. And that might, you might say, is that pretty low or is that a substantial amount of computing? Well, these days uh, we are entering the year of exascale computing. Sometime in the next year, the world's first exascale computer will be stood up. What does that mean? Well, this is the term exascale refers to how many floating point operations the machine can actually perform. Uh, the, the term for the machine's performance is actually exaflop. These machines can do an exaflop of performance or 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. And that, by the way, is 64 bits. So it's double precision, it's high precision math. It can do a quintillion floating point operations each second. And that's the machines that are going to be stood up again this year. Frontier at Aurora here in the United States. Uh, China is also racing to build up, you know, potentially the first uh, exaflop machine as well. Um, and so these machines are, are going 10 to the 18th operations per second. And I just told you, oh, by the way, uh, to put this in pers perspective compared to previous machines, uh, a machine in 2004, uh, that, that was exciting to us in that day, uh, called Red Storm, another room-sized machine, just like all these big supercomputers are, uh, could do uh, 42 teraflops. Uh, so this machine is equivalent of 23,000 of those, give you some idea of the pace of progress in the, in the world of supercomputing. Um, or it's the equivalent of, we'll talk briefly about GPUs, it's the equivalent of 133,000 of a pretty solid uh, NVIDIA GPU which some of you that are serious about scientific computing may be using in your departmental machines, for example, to accelerate your math. But at any rate, uh, one thing you may already have noticed is that I said, don't do more than about a billion operations on your laptop. Uh, and here we're talking about going 10 to the 18th per second on these machines. This is a ridiculous difference in computing power. You know, it's 10, 12 orders of magnitude, depending on how much patience you have. That is, even for a physicist such as myself, uh, talking 10 or 12 orders of magnitude is always something that gets your attention. And in, indeed it should. It tells you the difference in capability between somebody that only knows how to program on a laptop versus somebody that knows how to do parallel computing on a supercomputer. It is completely different class of programming. Uh, it is so transformative on the kind of problems that you can approach that you're not even doing the same thing. And that is why uh, you know, the, the exascale, exaflop year that we're in right now really brings into focus how important it is to be a parallel programmer if you wanna do anything that's leading edge. So, and by the way, when I first put that slide together for my class last year, I, uh, I, I said, wow, that's, that's again, 10, 12 orders of magnitude. That really even catches my attention. I mean, I knew it in the back of my head, of course, I've known it for years as the gap grew and grew and grew, but uh, I thought, how can I put this into more human terms? Well, that gap is bigger than the gap between a typical fifth grader working with a pencil and paper and a computer like an IBM 709, which was kind of a state-of-the-art computer from the, uh, the 1960s. So this kid is closer to being uh, a computer than, uh, than your laptop is to, to, to challenging a uh, uh, supercomputer to doing any kind of calculation. I mean, it's an enormous, enormous gap. So why is this? Why is there such a huge difference? Why, why are your laptops or your departmental workstations so hopeless to do uh, leading-edge high-performance computing? Um, and uh, let me take a look over at chat. By the way, as I go along here, I'll, I'll glance over at the chat channel. Uh, the TAs, Tom in particular, will be picking off a lot of stuff. If we go through things here, it looks like he is keeping up with stuff. But if you ask questions in chat, I will try to, to pick them off myself, especially if they're relevant to what we're talking about here. Uh, and, there, and there are no pending questions at the moment about this. Uh, so uh, the the real end of kind of serial computing at all being exciting in terms of moving forward and computers getting a lot faster happened about 15 years or so ago at this point. Uh, as a matter of fact, it has a pretty sharp cusp in the graph of computing performance, which is something I've got in front of you here. This happens to be a graph of a very uh, popular benchmark called spec, uh, spec in benchmarks. Uh, and uh, they, they capture a variety of different performance characteristics that are relevant to people doing scientific codes. Uh, and if we look at this benchmark as it's performed over the years on a variety of popular pro processors, that's where we have a lot of data points here, you'll notice that right around the year 2004, 
uh, things really dropped off. And this is a logarithmic graph here. And so this is a big steep drop off here. Prior to that, Moore's law, something we'll talk about in just a moment, but then you can basically think of as improvements in hardware meant that basically computer speeds doubled every couple of years for a typical laptop, but also for a supercomputer. And so if you wrote even a serial code, you wrote a Python code back in the 90s, uh, and you ran it two years later, it was going to run twice as fast with no input from you, no improvements from you. And that was the trend for most of the history of digital computing. However, right around 2004, things quit improving quite so much. And as a matter of fact, you, you do notice nobody really cares about clock speeds anymore. If you bought a computer uh, this past year, it probably ran at two or three gigahertz plus or minus. If you bought a computer 10 years ago, it ran at two or three gigahertz plus or minus. And if you buy a computer five years from now, it's gonna run at two or three gigahertz plus or minus. No, things are not doubling anymore every couple of years anymore. And you can see that in this graph right here. As a matter of fact, it's kind of sad how far behind we've already fallen. You know, we're now 15, 20 times behind where we would have been had this not happened, but that's the reality. Now, why did this happen? It is not as some people think that Moore's law is dead. Now, Moore's law is a, uh, a term that's uh, co-opted by many, many other people outside of uh, digital circuit design, uh, and they apply it to lots of things where the technology just improves geometrically for a lot of stuff, maybe hard drive capacities or things just that are outlandishly outside of digital computing in general. But Moore's law has a very specific definition. Gordon Moore, working back at Intel in the uh, mid 60s, observed that in the early days of uh, digital circuits, integrated circuits, uh, observed that uh, they could increase the number of transistors in a given area of integrated circuit by about a factor of two every 18 months or two years or so. And he predicted that this would uh, continue for a little while. Uh, however, it has continued for many decades and an, an absurdly long amount of time, especially given the number of changes in fabrication technologies that have happened over that period of time. But amazingly enough, the engineers have kept Moore's law on track. Now, finally, in the past couple of years, you might say Moore's law is finally starting to, to peter out. And indeed, that may be the case. Uh, you can make an argument Moore's law is already dead. Uh, you can make an argument it's got a little more life left in it. But at any rate, nobody thinks that Moore's law is healthy anymore. Uh, but it, 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 didn't, it isn't dead. It didn't die back in 2004, and it's not completely dead yet. You can see this. You know, We still have, if you pay attention to the press releases from companies, you still say, see Intel or TMSC saying, you know, we're on seven nanometers, maybe for your cell phone. Um, it's going to be seven nanometer process and we're moving on to five nanometer processes. So they're still pushing ahead. Moore's law is not completely dead. Uh, but, but again, it's getting there. What has happened, and by the way, you can see this also in the number of transistors in, in modern processors. If you look at processors over the past uh, you know, decades, you can see the engineers continue to give us more and more to the point where processors today have many billions of transistors. Uh, and there are some extreme cases that are even hitting a trillion transistors. So the, the engineers have kept, kept giving us the, the, the uh, circuitry. But this is what has happened. And this is probably the most uh, important slide to understand of uh, this presentation, certainly, maybe in the next two days, if you really want to understand modern computing. And so we'll take a second here to pick this apart. It's not that difficult to understand. This slide, basically, on the right-hand side is showing us clock rates over the past however many decades. And you can see that plateau that we saw in 2004 were clock rates for a variety of different processes. You're kind of plateaued. Uh, they, you know, again, we're running at you know two, three gigahertz on your processors today, the same as 10 years ago and the same as maybe 10 years from now. Things are just really not improving very much. And that's responsible for the fact that uh, yeah, serial computing has just kind of hit the same plateau. Why is this? Well, again, we saw it's not Moore's law. We, modern processors have a lot more transistors than one from even five or 10 years ago. Instead, it's this over here. This is how much heat we're dissipating in a modern processor. And it looks a little intimidating at first. Your units are watts per square centimeter. And if you're not a physicist, you might not feel comfortable, but this is actually very easy to understand. Watts per square centimeter these days is up to nearly 100 watts per square centimeter. 100 watts of heat is something you can all grasp because I think we're all still familiar with uh, incandescent light bulbs, even though they, they're reaching the end of their technological road as well. 100 watt incandescent light bulb, if you put your hand on it, you'd burn yourself immediately. That's a lot of heat, right? That's how much heat a modern computer chip is dissipating in the, an area the size of a postage stamp. So in a tiny little area here, we're dissipating over 100 watts of power when a chip's running full out filling computation. That's impressive. It should impress you that the chips don't melt and the engineers are striving very hard to keep them from melting. 
But you can also see that they have hit the wall. That's as hot as they can run the chips before they will melt. And so today we are running well hotter than a hot plate. That's not an exaggeration that we're running hotter than a hot plate. As a matter of fact, every so often somebody finds this out and somebody will post on the internet. Let me see, I have to switch out of my cursor to get this to run. And somebody will post on the internet a clever video clip like this, where you can see them frying on their CPU or cooking something on their CPU. And that is not an unusual case. That's a regular everyday CPU running away inside of a regular everyday desktop machine. Uh, and that's how hot they run. They really do run hotter than a hot plate. And so the engineers hit the limit, hit the wall with how hot the chips could run. Things were just going to melt. And they could apply very exotic technologies because this is not the first time that this problem has occurred. So, uh, you know, back in the mid 80s, for example, we looked at a Cray supercomputer. Uh, it had this very fancy and elaborate and, and somewhat beautiful uh, heat exchanger in front of it that had burbling away like a fountain uh, uh, liquid coolant. And so you can liquid cool a machine to keep it from melting, uh, but that's not very practical. You certainly don't want that in your, uh, your laptop and, uh, or your cell phone for that matter. Um, so that wasn't the solution. So the engineers had one other solution they could go with as they had more and more transistors but couldn't run them faster and faster, and that was to go parallel. And so this is kind of the basic mathematics of things, how things went parallel. They basically, uh, the engineer said, okay, we've got more and more transistors to work with. So instead of, instead of cranking up the clock rate and the voltage and things like we had in the past, in particular the clock rate, the frequency, instead of cranking up the frequency and making things run faster, what if we actually did the opposite? What if we backed off a little bit the frequency, the clock rate, made things run a little bit slower, and then we could decrease the voltage. And that means the power goes down a whole lot. As a matter of fact, just by backing off the clock rate 15%, we get the power to go down by about 50%. And that means we can stick two of these chips in the same power budget. So with the same amount of power, we can run two of these chips just by backing each one of them off by 15% of their clock rate. So in other words, you can get a lot more performance for the same power, and that means the cooling requirement's the same. So your cell phone's not gonna melt. You know, if you run your cell phone these days, you know it runs uh, hot when it does things, you can feel it uh, when it's doing things that are more intense. And so you can stick multiple cores in your cell phone and it's not gonna melt and they get more computing power, but you do have to use those multiple cores instead of one core running very fast. And that's why everything today is parallel, including your cell phone. So cell phones today all have multiple cores. And as a matter of fact, if you buy the latest greatest cell phone, right, it'll be between Apple and Samsung saying who's got more cores on their processor. Uh, but at any rate, this is where that comes from. It comes from the requirement that engineers couldn't just keep cranking up the clock speeds. So for the same power, they could run more cores at a slightly reduced performance per core, but get more speed. And this has made its way into everything. So here on your laptop today, you'll find a tremendous amount of parallelism uh, just built into it that you may not even be aware of. So here are some uh, processors over the years going back to about the turn of the century and uh, going up to a relatively modern one like you might find in your laptop. I have here in my laptop, a Skylake processor from Intel. And if we look at the number of flops or floating point operations per cycle that a processor used to give uh, or a processor can deliver, they used to be something like three or four, you know, math operations you would get per clock tick. And back in that period of time, we thought that was even impressive. That's, you know, that's parallel right there. The, each clock tick, I get multiple math operations out of this processor. Well, this parallel stuff is, is so important today and it's set into the processors so deeply that today on a Skylake processor, and again, this isn't particularly leading edge, uh, you get 2,700 math operations for every clock tick. And that is because of a variety of different parallel programming techniques that we're going to look at how many cores you have and vector processing, and we'll get into this stuff. But the important takeaway here is that even on a desktop machine today, if you don't do parallel programming, if you have a very serial code, you can't get even a tiny fraction of the performance of that laptop processor. To make that laptop processor work well, you have to do a lot of parallel programming or else you're getting, again, not a, literally not a fraction of a percent of the potential performance if you just have inherently serial code. You can see how parallel everything's got. Or to tie together a lot of the things we've been talking about here into one slide, you can see that the transistor counts have gone up, continue to go up over the years and the decades, but the performance plateaued here. The reason we now know was because the power hit this limit where the things just were on the threshold of melting. And so they couldn't keep the clock speeds going up. And so in order to keep the performance going up, they kept increasing the number of cores. They made things more and more parallel. And so this in one slide right here is the history of computing, modern computing, 
and the future of modern computing. So if you have any doubts that this parallel computing stuff is uh, a fad and it's going to go away, I hope this dismisses it. You can see that this is, these, these law rules are written by, the, by Mother Nature. These are laws of nature here, thermodynamics in particular. And that's not gonna change anytime soon. So parallel computing is, uh, is not because computer scientists are fond of it. It's because the engineers have no alternative. So I hope I've uh, given you some evidence that parallel computing is uh, the future and very much the present. It's no longer the future. You know, a couple of decades ago, parallel computing for the normal person was the future. Now, like I said, your cell phone is very parallel. Nobody can write uh, a cheesy video game. Your, your video game consoles are all multi-core. You can't write a video game without being a parallel programmer anymore. So parallel computing is extremely established, uh, but uh, it's still not the standard technique that you, you learn in your computer science class or your basic programming class. Uh, hence the fact that many of you are here. So what's the general idea of programming, parallel computing uh, across all the different techniques? It's that parallel computing isn't just this given that we throw more processors at something and we can just automatically speed it up. So you can kind of gang up on problems and get you know, parallel improvements in lots of different classes of problems. Understanding the differences, which problems fit where uh, is, is a big part of parallel, successful parallel programming, avoiding frustration. Um, and so, uh, by the way, this book, like I say, is a classic. I hope all of you read it. There's another, uh, uh, let's see, uh, it's got lots of things in there, like uh, two programmers can do in two months what one programmer can do in one month. You know, it's a, well, lots of very, very valuable insights that we all learn the hard way in that book. Uh, at any rate, uh, we're going to pick an application here and see some of these different parallel programming techniques applied to this uh, application. And I'll pick one that's pretty intuitive for everybody to understand weather modeling. I think we all get the idea of what we're trying to do with weather modeling. Uh, so a classic weather modeling uh, from the National Weather Service back in the, in the 70s might have been take a weather map like this. You divide it up into a grid like you do for lots of scientific problems, where break your problem up into, into an array. Uh, and then our CPU would go over this array and apply whatever math operations represented those uh, fluid flow, fluid dynamics, and thermodynamics equations that basically determine weather uh, characteristics and dynamics. And you'd go over this grid and apply those to each point on the grid. And that would advance you in time, maybe a minute forward, and then you'd go and do the same thing again. And by going over this grid, you know, in a kind of a raster pattern, time after time, we might advance ourselves, you know, a day into the future, 24 hours in the future, and that's our weather prediction for tomorrow. So that's a standard serial way of doing weather modeling which has been uh, quite obsolete for a long time now. Instead, we do everything in parallel. As a matter of fact, a guy named Richardson in 1917 recognized how to do something, uh, how to do this kind of problem in parallel. Uh, and what Richardson had in mind in 1917 was that he would have 64,000 meteorologists gathered together uh, in a, a, a very large facility. And each meteorologist would be responsible for a small patch, maybe a county of, uh, of their, their, their country uh, doing the weather modeling. And all that we need to do to figure out the weather 10 minutes into the future would be to communicate with their four neighbors to the Northeast, South and West, what the weather is. Because to figure out the weather 10 minutes in the future, all I need to know is my immediate neighborhood. I don't need to know what's going on if I'm here in uh, Pennsylvania. I don't need to know what's going on on the West Coast to figure out my weather 10 minutes in the future. I only need to know the weather immediately around me. Remember, I could kind of look out the window into the distance for 10 minutes ahead and see what's going to happen to me 10 minutes you know, into the future. So the immediate neighborhood is gonna determine the weather in the immediate future. So I can calculate my, my weather 10 minutes in the future just by communicating with my four nearest neighbors. So we all do that. All 64,000 meteorologists do that. Now we've all got our valid prediction 10 minutes in the future. Well, now we all do the exact same thing again. I communicate with my nearest neighbors and we can all advance our prediction of the future. So, uh, you know, the, the weather that's far away over here eventually is going to impact me, you know, hours into the future. But you know what? It's going to propagate across the map one grid point at a time and get to me just as it would in reality. So I never need to know more than my immediate neighborhood. And this nearest neighbor kind of grid based scheme, uh, again, was invented by Richardson or with the notion of a bunch of people with uh, pencil and paper or mechanical calculators doing it, we realize now that's kind of hopelessly naive. Uh, weather modeling is turned to a chaotic fluid flow. Nobody's doing that with a pencil and paper, even in their local neighborhood. Uh, but the technique remains today. And so today we would take that weather service problem and we'd break up our map. And if we were to do this with say a computer with four cores in it, we might break up the map like this. So each core 
would be responsible for a quarter of the map. And so it has a lot less work to do than if it had to do the whole map. And we might hope that this would run four times faster. And indeed, it, it probably would run roughly four times faster. And each core in trying to determine the, the weather it's responsible for only needs to communicate with its neighbor along the boundary. It only needs to know what's going on on the immediate boundary. So sure, weather from down here might move north over a period of time, but it's only it's got to cross this boundary one step at a time. So we can break the map up into pieces. Each core is only responsible for each, its piece. And when it needs to know something about what's going on to the south of it, this core right here, it can just look at the, the place in memory where the map is storing these this strip here immediately to its south, and it can do its calculations. So this would be a, a nice multi-core way to speed up this problem. Uh, the technique we might use for this would be something like OpenMP would be the most popular way to do multi-core programming like this. Uh, and this would indeed speed things up by a factor of four. You can think of this like having four meteorologists in a room sharing the map, like we were just talking about with Richardson's scheme. So they're all in the room, they're all staring, staring at the same map and uh, looking at the same data, but they're only responsible for calculating one quarter of the map. And that's standard multi-core programming. And it looks like this directive-based programming stuff here. Uh, we go into it with our multi-core programming workshops. We won't get into it much deeper here. We'll talk a little bit more comparatively about this tomorrow uh, in the outro to computing talk after you're an MPI programmer, uh, but that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, GPU programming is something that's extremely important these days. So most of you are probably aware of that fact that uh, uh, the GPUs have somehow infiltrated, GPUs being graphics, repurposed graphics cards from video games have somehow become a big part of scientific computing. It also become a big part of crypto mining and other things as well. But the, the, as far as scientific world is concerned, uh, they become these incredibly powerful computing devices that you can order off Amazon, plug into your departmental workstation in your chemistry department, and somehow get your chemistry package to run five times faster because you bought this video card. And uh, that, that is indeed the reality. Now, video cards have an extremely different architecture from a normal CPU. This is something that people only come to appreciate as they start to try to use the cards or program the cards. They are not some uh, version of a, of a CPU beefed up or with a lot more CPU cores. Instead, they are very different design. You'll hear something like a, a GPU might have 4,000 cores in it, and you'll think that's like 4,000 little regular processors. No, their processors are very different. They're much more limited in a sense, but you have a lot more of them. The memory layout's very, very different. So this is the kind of thing we dive into with our GPU programming course. Uh, but suffice it to say that they are, are not a normal CPU architecture in any way, shape, or form, and they continue to evolve and, and mutate very rapidly uh, as the field advances, something that, field that didn't exist basically 20 years ago, and now every two years out come very different new designs to really push, you know, push the architectures forward. And the way this programming works is uh, it's different because we've got this device over here, this GPU, that's very powerful with doing certain types of calculations, but it's very limited in other things that it can do. And so we've got to move the data from our general purpose CPU, where our weather map might be living and, and computing. We've got to move that data over to the GPU. And we need to do that over the bus that it's plugged in. So when you buy one of these cards, a video game card in general, uh, you plug it into a PCI bus typically uh, on the motherboard. So you're plugging this card into a slot. And that PCI bus is compared to the other communication speeds in the computer, it's pretty slow and limited and it takes a long time to get the data across. But once you get the data onto the GPU, then you hope you can number crunch away there because it's gonna be very fast. So the GPU is very fast and you do your weather map processing. And then you gotta get your data back to your CPU to do anything else that, that, it, that the GPU is not capable of doing. Because again, it's somewhat limited in its capabilities. And so this type of programming, GPU programming involves data shuffling back and forth and understanding the limitations of the GPU. This is the kind of thing you might do with CUDA or OpenACC. Um, and this is the equivalent, in my mind, a good analogy is this is like having one meteorologist, uh, but they have a room full of math savants. So people that don't understand the meteorology well, but they're very good at doing pure number crunching. Uh, but the communication between them is, is pretty poor. So you got your one meteorologist and they got a thousand math savants on hand, but they got to communicate using uh, tin cans and a string. So you got a very poor communication channel. Well, if you can cope with this stuff well, you can make GPUs do great things. But you can see it's not as simple as just writing a normal serial code and saying, hey, run this on a GPU. Uh, and again, the way you can program this could be something either tricky looking like CUDA or more modern approach like using OpenACC, uh, this kind of thing we talk about in the GPU programming workshop. But the reason that uh, those approaches are not the dominant way of programming big things on supercomputers is that they're both limited 
to working on a single node, a single workstation, a single box basically sitting somewhere because they all assume that the data is accessible in one single pool, whether it's sitting in a GPU or whether it's sitting in a shared data of a multi-core workstation, uh, that, that limits how big the, the code can grow. Instead, we wanna run these days on hundreds of thousands or even millions of cores on the bigger machines these days. So if you wanna run on hundreds of thousands of cores, you need to have some way of dealing with the fact that data is going to be spread out. It can't all be sitting in one shared pool of memory. And you might say, well, why can't it be? Why can't the engineers all have, the, have one big pool of memory that all the processors work with? And the simple reason is that the contention, the simple, the, the physical realities of electronic connections to a pool of memory means having all of these processors trying to connect to the same memory chips would mean that when one chip's accessing the memory, it's blocking out the other chips. So what would be what's called contention, memory contention would become the, uh, the, the foremost, the, basically the, the overwhelming bottleneck. It would prevent anything from happening. It'd all be sitting around waiting for one processor to get done accessing memory before the other processor can access memory. By the way, that memory contention problem already becomes the major problem, even on a simple laptop. So if you take our, our multi-core programming course, like our OpenMP course, you'll find out that even using your laptop, once you start using uh, you know, more than a couple of cores, this memory contention issue shows up. So it, it happens very quickly, let alone talking about hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of cores. So instead we need to have a bunch of uh, our problems spread out over a bunch of different processors with independent memory. So they can all work away independently on their chunk of the problem without all interfering with each other. And this distributed memory processing is where MPI comes into play. So now we take our weather map and we break up it into a bunch of pieces. Maybe in the United States, we break it up into 50 pieces for our 50 states. And each processor only needs to work on one state. So we might hope we speed the problem up 50 times. So each processor is just working on its state and that's great. They don't interfere with each other and the thing scales up very nicely. But the problem, as you're going to find out as MPI programmers, is now we do have to communicate our data between the two neighboring states very explicitly. I can't just go look at someplace else in my array sitting in memory because my array in memory is only my data. This is an array in memory on a separate computer sitting somewhere on the other side of the room and only connected to me via some network, via Ethernet or something. And so I've got to go and request that data from that processor to look at what's going on on my northern border. And that processor needs to get information from me to understand what's going on on its southern border. And so this explicit communication is where we spend our time as MPI programmers. And you're going to get good at this and understand and appreciate it before we're done. But uh, this is does take more effort than the previous two programming models. But the rewards are it can scale infinitely. You can build a machine as big as you can afford and MPI will support it. So this is like having 50 meteorologists working on the problem. They're all very good on their own state. They could do everything they need to do, but they do need to communicate using, I call it a telegraph here. They need to communicate data back and forth between each other along their borders, hopefully a limited amount of data. And this is MPI programming and it's what we're about to do. Now, let me talk briefly about the actual hardware that supports these things. The, these machines are, are, the big machines, the supercomputers usually called massively parallel processors as the name suggests, they're, they're very massive room-sized machines that are very parallel. And the biggest ones these days, and I'll give you a kind of a list of them in a moment, have get hundreds of thousands or millions of processors, but they're made up of smaller pieces that look kind of like regular high-end scientific workstations like you might have in your department or maybe under your desk uh, when you're doing scientific computing. And so they're made up of regular processors and some of them have, a lot of them have accelerators, GPUs plugged into them and they're connected together with a network that looks kind of maybe in some ways like the network that you might have connecting your clusters together uh, wherever you happen to do computing. Uh, so that's what the big MPPs look like. But there are many, many levels of parallelism within these machines. So if we look at it here, at the, we'll start at the lowest level. Uh, if you look at a modern computer processor, it has instructions inside of it to do a lot of things in parallel. As I said, just a modern Skylake processor today can do 2700 operations with every clock tick. So one of the ways it does it, it has some instructions built in that you hope uh, the compiler can magically access for you and do most of the work for you. Vector instructions are the most important of those. These are instructions. A vector instruction means it peels off a bunch of numbers at once instead of one number at a time and tries to do the same thing to all those numbers. You might imagine if you're doing something as basic as uh, playing back an MP3 file. Uh, an MP3 file has some compression on it, and so you might want to take all the bits in the MP3 file and apply some multiplication to them. A vector instruction is very good at doing that. It'll just peel off a whole bunch of bytes at once. So instead of grabbing one byte at a time and doing some math operations, it'll grab a bunch of bytes and try to do that math operation simultaneously on 
maybe 64 bytes at once. So that's what vector instructions do. They work on multiple uh, bytes at once. Again, you hope the compiler does most of that. Then beyond that, the processors, they have an awful lot of tricky hardware built into them to try to do things as parallel as possible. They can shuffle things out of order and rename registers and do all kinds of stuff. They can effectively execute. They can try to execute branches in your code that aren't even uh, taken yet, just in case they are taken in the future. And they do a lot of fancy stuff I won't get into again because you hope the compiler and the hardware do it for you. Uh, I'll point out this stuff is so tricky that uh, some of this is where uh, a lot of the major security flaws in modern processors have popped up. So if you've heard of things like Spectre or Meltdown, this is why they've happened because of, uh, the, the, trick, the engineer's trickiness has exceeded their foresight. Um, but at any rate, we won't go into this a whole lot or anymore really because the compiler worries about this stuff and it's not your problem. Uh, now that's not entirely true in that somebody who's good at optimizing code does make their code work better with this. So if you're a video game programmer trying to squeeze out the last frame uh, per second out of your code, you need to worry about this stuff. Uh, and if you're, you've got a code you spend a lot of time writing, it might be worth taking an afternoon and trying to work with compile a little bit and optimize this stuff. But this is where you speed your code up by a factor of 20% or 30% if you're, you know, if you're good at this kind of stuff. We're going to talk about MPI where we're going to speed up our code by a factor of 10,000. So we're not going to worry about this pathetic 20% speed up right here. Uh, there is uh, there is a next level up a parallel program that we already talked about OpenMP using multiple cores in a single processor to speed things up within that single processor and that's where OpenMP it comes in and is fairly straightforward and easy to use. So our OpenMP workshop, you know, we like to, to say, hey, here's how where you can spend once you know how to use OpenMP, you can spend an hour and speed your code up by a factor of ten, kind of deal with OpenMP, and that that is possible uh, that is not entirely unrealistic. That's a neat thing about OpenMP programming. Likewise, with an accelerator, it's the kind of thing where you could spend, okay, once you understand GPU programming, maybe you spend a couple hours and you speed your code up by a factor of five with your GPU. And that's also possibly true. So these are other parallel programming things that we're also not going to ignore because we're going right for the big stuff. We're going right for the factor of 1,000, 10,000 with MPI. And MPI is the only serious way to program clusters or supercomputers. And when I say the only serious way, I mean, Right now on the big supercomputers in the world, and we'll show you a list of them in just a, a few slides. Uh, it is absolutely safe to say that 99 plus percent of the codes running on those machines right now are MPI. So what you're gonna learn with MPI is really the only serious way to program at large scale. But these are all the different levels that you can kind of go through to get to that large scale. But we're not going to talk about any of them pretty much until we get to our outro talk tomorrow. We'll compare, a few, we'll, get, we'll go back to a few of these concepts here. Uh, something we're not going to talk about much more at all, also, but that really is parallel and is important, is uh, uh, there are increasingly in scientific computing, there are, you can think of them as custom devices that, uh, or semi custom devices is a better way to sum these things up, that are used to do certain types of calculations that you know are very particular or peculiar to the science you're doing, but very important. So people today will make custom chips to do calculations, ASICs. Matter of fact, maybe the most well-known version of that is people do uh, custom chips to do crypto mining, you know, Bitcoin mining, they now so important to people, they make their own custom chips to do it. Uh, or they'll use FPGA, still programmable gate arrays to do this. But these also have very important roles in real science. So people will do scientific programming with these custom chips or, or semi-custom programmable gate arrays or digital signal processors, which are very dedicated uh, chips. Uh, and this is important, but we're not gonna get into it, but it is an important area of parallel computing. Uh, another very important thing that's so boring, we don't talk about it until it affects you is the IO system. Uh, all these big parallel computers have parallel disk systems. If you're successful and your code runs 10,000 times faster, well, guess what? Your old disk you know, drive isn't going to keep up with feeding data or reading results back from that code. So you really need a parallel disk system. And we'll briefly talk about it because we hope that the, the people who built the hardware set up a nice parallel disk system and you don't have to worry about it a whole lot. But we'll come back to this topic uh, tomorrow. But, uh, but for now, we're just going to focus on the main thing, which is how to get that factor of 10,000. But before we leave here, let's, let's show how the pieces fit together. So first, we said modern processors all have multiple cores. So here's a chunk of memory and six cores in our processor that access it. And again, even your cell phone has you know, six core processors. And the way you could program those would be with OpenMP. That's all you were concerned about programming. And that would be a very quick and dirty way to get good usage out of those cores. But you might decide you need more processing power. So you buy a GPU, you plug it in, 
And you can use something like OpenACC to program that GPU. And now you sped your code up by a factor of five and you're happy because maybe that's all you needed for your code. But if you wanna go beyond that, if you need to speed up more than you can do with a single workstation, you really only have one alternative and that is MPI. With MPI, we can glue together a network as large as we can afford essentially. And so that is the, the, the name of the game these days with the biggest supercomputers is how much money do you have and, or how much power do you have? How many megawatts do you have that you can afford to power the machine with? and you could build a machine as big as you'd like with MPI. But even for smaller machines, even if you only wanna have a cluster with say 20 machines in it, still MPI is the way you go because you, you can't use these other techniques across different workstations. They're meant to be stay within the shared machine. They're meant to, to stay within this, the same pool of memory, the same electrical connections that don't work across networks. So if you wanna do any kind of parallel programming across networks, MPI is your answer. So I've used a bunch of terms already, and I've probably already confused a few of you or, or raised some ambiguities at least, and it would get worse as we go along if I didn't take a moment to clarify what the terminology is. Uh, and people will throw around parallel computing, the term cores and nodes and processors uh, constantly, and they'll misuse them or they'll assume you understand from context what they really meant. And so as a, as a beginner, it, it can be confusing, but even as somebody that's, that's got a lot of experience, I will occasionally have to ask somebody to clarify what exactly they're talking about. Um, so here's the terminology you would have absolutely supposed to mean. A core is anything that can just run its own independent little program. The technical will say a thread of code, but anything that can run its own independent little program is a core. So inside of your laptop right now in front of you, you, you might have a four core laptop. That means it can be running simultaneously four entirely separate programs like your web browser, your Zoom session, to be compiling something in the background. Those four cores don't more or less care what the other cores are doing. They're entirely independent. And so uh, because they're independent little things, sometimes there's a temptation to call it a processor. So some people might say, I've got four processors in my laptop. And now really you should call that a core because technically, so again, we're talking about technical definitions here, not how people tend to use them. Technically a processor is the physical chip. So if you pull open your laptop, you see there's one chip in your laptop. Even though it has four cores, it's got one chip. That one chip with four cores is the processor. Or if you have a desktop machine, you can update it. So you go onto Amazon and you order a new or better processor. The thing that comes in the mail that you plug into the socket is your processor. So that's the, the difference. And again, these get blurred an awful lot in use, but a processor is the physical chip and package. And these days processors all have multiple cores and the core is just basically an independent little CPU of its own. It can do whatever it wants to do. If you start putting these things together into bigger machines, uh, you'll typically call anything that's on a motherboard a node. So if you stick, you can stick multiple processors even on a motherboard, multiple socket motherboards, uh, and you can stick you know, two or four of them are not uncommon on a big supercomputer, and you'll call that a node. Uh, or when you start sticking them in big cabinets and everything, they can be called blades as well. So your node or your blade uh, is something that you start to consider as kind of a, an independent you know, motherboard inside of a cabinet. Uh, and maybe the best technical way to think of it is each, each node or blade or motherboard from the network's perspective is a, is a separate endpoint. So a motherboard in a big machine room full of cabinets, each motherboard has its own network endpoint. It has its own, so whatever kind of expensive, fancy network you have or whatever its design is, at the end of each connection is a motherboard. And there might be two processor sockets on there, and that might amount to 24 cores, but they're all in that one motherboard in the cabinet. So that's a node. We start to, as we start to build up bigger machines, this is the kind of terminology we should use. Now, again, people misuse these things so much, and it's so tempting to call a core a processor uh, that uh, computer science types have decided that to, to come up with their own term that's not kind of overloaded, doesn't have a lot of baggage, and that's called a processing element or a PE. And that's what I'll try to use a lot in our MPI programs, and it's not just me, it's a pretty common usage. So whenever I talk about a PE, uh, in a normal machine that corresponds to a core, basically something that can run its own program. So a processing element is just something that can go and do its, run its own separate program. And then you might group them together into processors and build big machines full of cabinets, full of nodes and build up, you know, whatever kind of hierarchy you build. At the end of the day, the smallest thing that can run an actual independent program we'll call a PE. But again, for everything that we're talking about here on bridges or on your laptop or the cluster you're gonna build yourself, that really corresponds to a core. So this is, this, this is the terminology, and I'll try to use it consistently myself over the next uh, uh, couple of days. So I keep talking about these big machines. Well, let's specifically look at uh, the top, top 10 machines out there. 
And it's not hard to find this list uh, to assemble a list like this because uh, there is a, a site called top500.org. Any of you that are interested in this kind of stuff should visit it and poke around. It's a nice place that gathers uh, the top machines in the world, top 500 nominally. Uh, and you can submit using their, they have a standard benchmark called Linpack. Uh, and run it, you run that benchmark and you can rank your machine. And if it's in the top 500, you can submit it there. And it's a nice place to go and see what the fastest machines in the world look like. And these days, if we look at the top 10 machines out there, which look an awful lot like the, the uh, most of the list here, you'll see that they have uh, all multiprocessor, multi-core processors. So I've, I've kind of stuck in here, this is where I say C here is how many cores there are. So we can see that the fastest machine in the world as of June, the list is updated uh, twice a year. It'll be updated in, uh, in November. So uh, as of June, the, uh, the fastest machine in the world had a bunch of ARM cores, each with 48 uh, cores uh, per processor running at 2.2 gigahertz. Um, the second fast machine at Power 9. So it's not all just a bunch of Intel like clone cores here, but there are plenty of Intels in the list as well. Um, but they're all multi-core. Many of them have accelerators or GPUs basically plugged into them. So you can see here, a lot of top machines have NVIDIA uh, Volta processors, GPUs accelerating them. Uh, and they all have networks connecting together a bunch of these, these nodes because there are millions of cores or at least hundreds of thousands for anything that even makes a top 10. So you can see these parallel concepts I'm talking about are rife within these machines here. It's not, these aren't mildly parallel machines. And that goes all the way to the end of the top 500 list. Machine number 500, whatever it is, I guarantee you, a very, very, very parallel machine. Uh, they also take uh, an enormous amount of power. That's a limiting factor. So when I was telling you about the things melting before, uh, if you don't think that's serious, look at this machine it takes nearly 30 megawatts of power. Uh, that's a lot of cooling because the end result of all computing is uh, heat. All computers do is generate heat. If you look at the power, when you plug your computer into the wall and it's running away there, however many watts it generates, all it's generating is heat. You know, you think of the output of computing as useful information or a fun video gaming session, but from a physics perspective, all computers do is, is convert electricity into heat. And so when I talk about cooling, you can see this machine here, in addition to its 29 megawatts of power, uh, needs to dissipate that much heat somewhere as well. Uh, okay, let's see, I saw a few questions uh, floating by. Each processor is the same node, share memory, so on. So on uh, is each processor in the same? Oh, somebody else answered the question. Let's see if it was an accurate answer. Uh, and that was, that's not a bad answer there. Yes, processors on the same node share memory, uh, but because the memory might be closer to one processor or another processor, if you're really concerned about performance, you might be concerned about that non-uniform memory access or NUMA. So again, for people optimizing, they want to get that 20% to 30% on a single node, they'll have to worry about is the memory on the right chip to be closest to my particular processor or even core and some you know, caching. There's lots of stuff that goes on at that lower level of optimization. We talk about this stuff a lot more in the OpenMP workshop. Uh, but yes, so on a single node, everything shares memory. And sharing memory is the simplest way for everybody to go. I mean, sharing memory makes your programming simpler. We don't have to move data back and forth. Uh, it makes life easier for everybody. But again, you can only uh, share memory so much before the processors spend all their time waiting to access that single pool of memory. And so that's why if you wanna get serious about scalability, like on these machines here, you'll see, while there are 48 cores sharing memory on a node, the vast majority of the machine is built up of, of nodes having to shuffle data, not sharing memory. Most of the data moving on this machine is not moving between these 48 cores, it's moving back and forth between the many hundreds of thousands of nodes here. So, uh, let's see, lower power means it's better. Uh, well, lower power is certainly desirable when it becomes a limiting factor of building these machines. And as a matter of fact, that's why there's a, a green 500 list as well. So if you look up the green 500 list, you'll see people ranking their machines by which ones are most efficient because that is important. Uh, so yes, power, uh, lower power, I mean, lower power and lower performance is, a, is an obvious trade-off. But getting good performance with relatively low power is something to be proud of and something that's very important is machine design. As a matter of fact, the, the first exascale machine or exaflop machine could have been built a couple of years ago uh, if somebody was just willing to tolerate the ridiculous power usage to just build a bigger machine room. People have really been limited by the desire to have a somewhat same power envelope, although it looks like that, that might exceed, uh, I've got a couple slides here going on, it might exceed 40 or 50 megawatts, but at any rate, Lower power consumption is, is incredibly important. 
That's also important in the design, even these days of laptops and workstations, because you can only go so far before you have to start liquid cooling things, and that's not a good limitation. The, the plan, by the way, moving to the future, I've mentioned exascale machines, is to keep pushing these same limits. And so right now we live in, again, the age of exascale. The first machines after a decade plus of planning are about to come online, uh, in particular Frontier and Aurora, which are a little bit behind schedule because of uh, pandemic issues. But uh, they were hoping they would come on in line in 2021 and looks like early 2022 is probably when it happens. Uh, this, this project, it, it's, it actually is a particular project for those machines. Uh, has been going on for a long time, formally seven years, but well before that they started planning. Uh, you can see it's multiple billions going into it and the system designs uh, for the machines that are about to come online, again, aren't that drastically different from the ones we just looked at, just bigger. Everything's a little bit faster and a little bit bigger. And so uh, yeah, you can see we're, we're finding it across the exaflop barrier here with Frontier and Aurora, uh, but the, the power budget here, <laughs> under 60 megawatts is what is all they're guaranteeing at this point in time. And that's just an, uh, just an absolutely outlandish amount of power. Uh, so th these are, uh, well, uh, I guess I can make, well, we've got the slide apparel I'll quickly step through it here, but you can see that the nodes themselves look like kind of normal computing nodes. There's nothing that exotic on a node by node basis. Uh, the processors are, you know, kind of look like, like normal processors here. The GPUs are newer generation of GPUs, but they're not completely different. They're the same GPUs that you'll be able to, to buy not too long thereafter and plug into your workstations. The interconnect, in the case of the two most interesting machines here, the slingshot is a dragonfly network. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, so they're, they're basically just bigger, better versions of, of the big machines that are out there now. Um, networks is something I do want to briefly talk about because it is so important to MPI programmers when you start to scale things up. It's important that you understand at least basically what your network looks like. And luckily, as much as networks can become very technically involved and, and detail uh, oriented, in their design, at the top level, there are really only three things to understand that largely characterize a network. That's the latency, the bandwidth, and the topology. And so we'll step through these. The latency is the time it takes to send uh, a message from one node to another node. And usually you wanna cite the worst case latency. So on a big network, it's the worst case. The two furthest apart nodes, how long does it take to send some data back and forth? Uh, but it assumes it's just a small amount of data. It's just kind of the lag time to get there. And so if you've got a code that sends lots and lots of small messages, latency can often be the dominant factor that affects the total performance. On the other hand, maybe you've got a code that sends huge amounts of messages or huge amounts of data, not a lot of messages, but a big chunk of data every time, in which case you care less about the latency and more about the bandwidth. How fast can I cram a large amount of data through the network? So one's kind of the length of the pipe, the other one's kind of the width of the pipe. And so if you draw a graph of how long it takes to send a packet of data out here, you can see that the latency is kind of this offset and then depending on the size of your packet, the bandwidth determines how long it takes to get there. So those are for a point-to-point -point connection that characterizes everything you need to know, but the networks is made up of lots of point-to-point -point connections. And so you need to know the shape of the network as well. It can be very important in determining performance. And the shape is, is not a, a trivial thing to, to, to select. There's not just one best choice. The simplest way to build a network in a way that many of you may find in your computer labs uh, is a kind of an ethernet network where you just each network is connected to the next one in a big daisy chain. And this is wonderful because if you buy a new workstation for the lab, you just plop it down on the desk, connect it up to the network and everybody's happy. So it's easy to administer. Works pretty well in general because people are all doing different things. So one person's using the network very heavily to download a file. Somebody else is just uh, browsing a web page locally, not doing much at all. So the network gets shared, but if everybody kind of does random stuff, it works out okay. However, if somebody starts trying to do uh, serious con com communication between these two nodes right here, and somebody here is trying to do serious communication between these two nodes, and they're hawking the whole network, they're going to get annoyed with each other. And that's exactly what scientific codes do. As we'll see, our weather problem, for example, all of our uh, weather nodes are trying to communicate with their neighbors at the same time. They've all updated their weather map and are trying, ready to move on to the next uh, minute in time and they need data from their neighbors. So most scientific codes, including the ones we're gonna write, use the network at the same time and they would be very unhappy with a network like this. So instead, you might build a network that looks like this, complete connectivity. So as these two nodes are communicating with each other here, these two nodes can communicate with each other and if nobody interferes with anybody, everybody's happy. And that's great. And nobody would dispute that complete connectivity is your best network. The only problem is this does not scale to, um, to even tens of nodes, let alone hundreds of thousands of nodes very well, because the number of connections scales is 
n squared here, right? So, uh, you know, if we have a even a thousand node network, we've got half a million connections. And you just physically can't make that many connections. And so complete connectivity is great. It's the best, it's just not doable for a large machine. So instead what people will often do is they'll buy a crossbar. Crossbar tries to fake complete connectivity. So if you build a cluster in a department, if you come across a cluster in a typical university department, it will often have a crossbar network connection. And that crossbar tries to fake being complete connectivity and does a good job up to some point but at some point it gets saturated and it hits its limit and then you don't have complete connectivity. And that's why people are sometimes disappointed. They'll buy a crossbar, assuming that it'll give them a cluster of you know, a dozen nodes and they'll run well. And then when they start to run their application, they find out that their application peaks at you know, four or five nodes. And it's because they hit the limits on the crossbar, which are pretty easy to hit usually but with serious applications. So instead, when people build serious clusters or massively parallel machines, they build tree-like networks is a common choice. A tree network looks something like this. So these are our compute nodes on the bottom and these are our network connections or routers <coughs> higher up in the network. And a, a tree is nice and that these two can communicate while these two communicate. The only problem with a simple tree like this, a binary tree, is that as we make our machine bigger and bigger, this one poor node at the top gets stressed more and more. It's got to pass all the communica communications between this half of the machine and this half of the machine. So if this node and this node want to communicate and this node and this node want to communicate, they've all got to go to this one router at the top. So the network gets stressed at its top level. And as a matter of fact, the way that we characterize this, we talk about the bisection bandwidth. So that's a, another term you'll see as, you, as soon as you start to talk about building any serious network, they'll say, what's the bisection bandwidth? That means if we bisect the network down the middle, if you cut your network in half, what's the bandwidth that you have at that point? And we'll find out for a binary tree, our bisection bandwidth doesn't grow as our network grows. And so we get problems as our network grows. We end up with all the nodes waiting on this node right here to pass data. So that's not really a, a useful tree. Instead, you build something like a fat tree. And a fat tree is, as the name suggests, fatter as you go up in the network. So here are all the compute nodes down at the bottom of this particular fat tree. And these circles are all different routers. And as we go up in our network here, we get more and more routers and we make the network fatter. And that way we have more and more connections. So our bisection bandwidth, if we were to cut this network in half right here and look at all the connections going across uh, across the two halves, we find we've got a lot of bandwidth here. So this network does scale much better. And there are different ways you can make a fat tree. There's different formulas for how many connections you have going up from every node and how many you have going down. And your different choices can result in different designs that look like uh, this. These rather artistic looking patterns are ways of drawing some different networks for different fat trees that are out there. Uh, and so you can have different, different designs and decisions on your fat tree that affect the performance. And there's no one best choice. It can depend on the applications. Your applications might want better bandwidth or better latency, or might run on smaller clusters of nodes or run across the whole machine. Uh, and your, your network technologies might be different. So one might use ethernet or different variations of InfiniBand or uh, OPA. And so you have lots of different choices that can affect what the topology, what shape you pick for your network. The latest most preferred one, you'll notice uh, if you look at the, the two upcoming exascale machines, they use something called a dragonfly network. And a dragonfly is uh, something that's taking advantage of some of the newer capabilities of modern networks, uh, which are high rate of switches. That's a fancy way of saying switches that have lots and lots of connections instead of a limited number of connections. And switches that are smart enough that they can do adaptive routing so the connection between any given point and any other given point on any one of these more complex networks have multiple ways to go. Well, it's nice if you've got congestion going on, if you can route your traffic differently. So adaptive routing is a, is a nice thing. Uh, and also another very important thing is that we're slowly transitioning from uh, copper links for all our network connections to optical links. And not slowly, so we're rapidly transitioning these days to optical links. So you still use copper links on, well, you, one, one popular choice, and even with machines with big budgets, is to use copper links, wire connections between local nodes, and they use the optical connections to span across uh, larger connections across the machine room. Remember, these big machines will be the size of a, of a football pitch. And so it's nice to have uh, optical connections when you've got to run things that are many meters, but local connections can be wired and can work out much better. And so when you start talking about having two different types of connections in your network, you might think that affects the topology because they have different characteristics and you'd be right. And so dragonfly networks are kind of these hybrid hierarchical networks where you can choose uh, different parameters to, to say what the connectivity is and the local connectivity and, and which ones are optical and copper links. So I give you a few examples right here of a 42 node dragonfly network and different ways you can build it. 
Uh, and so you'll again notice that the latest, greatest machines proposed, the first exascale machines will probably be Dragonfly network configurations. And lastly, there's still a, a network connection seems very outright uh, primitive compared to these, but is not entirely obsolete, the, the Taurus or the grid network connection. Um, this is still used on the resting machines. Uh, the 3D Taurus is really useful because it happens to map very well to a lot of physical problems. We talked about our weather map problem. Our weather map, by the way, in the real world is 3D. If you do a real weather map, you don't just have a flat map. You've got columns in the atmosphere, right? The atmosphere has a lot of depth to it. And so you've got a 3D grid. So if we did a real uh, weather map, we'd lay it out on the machine, it would probably be a 3D grid. And then it might be nice to accommodate our nearest neighbor communications with a network that looks a lot like it's dedicated to nearest neighbor communications. And that would be a 3D grid. And we actually call it a torus because uh, on the ends of the network, we'll wrap things around. So I haven't drawn any connections here between A and B, but A and B are actually connected around the outside. Uh, and that's really useful because it means if A and B have to communicate, they don't have to tunnel all the way back through the machine. And if you have periodic boundary, lots of reasons why a torus is a nice tweak if you can afford it. So the 3D torus is very simple seeming compared to the, uh, the fat trees and, and whatnot, but it still has its place uh, in particular because it has fewer connections per node, which you might think is just a pure drawback, but it means with fewer connections, you can make sure each connection is very fast. You can spend more money per connection. So you can typically have superior connections uh, with your torus connections, but fewer of them. So it's not completely obsolete. So these are the kind of networks that you're going to encounter as you build your own cluster uh, or jump on any of the existing clusters or get onto any of the big supercomputers. And it's important to have an idea of at least these general characteristics of them. And again, we could talk for many hours about lower level details and how important they are, but these general characteristics of them, the latency and the bandwidth and the general topology, uh, if you want to understand why your MPI codes run better or worse on one machine or another, or occasionally how you can accommodate in, in your MPI code to map better to the topology, take better advantage of a particular network. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the advanced MPI talk. I mentioned to you that IO is so boring, nobody wants to talk about it. But believe me, when you scale your code up to run 10,000 times faster, and then you find out that because of that, your code spends 80% of its time waiting for IO, you decide that IO becomes more interesting. And that's a common enough thing with large parallel codes is that the IO can become a significant fraction of the runtime. And so you should be grateful that in this day and age, people have built these very large parallel file systems. Uh, Luster on bridges is one that you'll come across quite commonly where uh, you hope that in a fairly transparent fashion that IO just scales up with your code. Now we'll talk in advanced MPI talk tomorrow about why that isn't always true and what you can do to deal with it. But believe me, serial IO is, is not an option. You know, plugging in the, the old USB stick does not work with uh, serious parallel codes. I mentioned to you that we're coming up on the year of Exascale and it's no surprise to people have been tracking this stuff. If we look at that top 500 list over the years, this is, uh, this is the fastest machine in the world. This is all the machines added together. You can see there's a reason that people were hoping that 2020 would be the year of exascale because we were kind of really coming up on, uh, coming, oh, here we go, that. We're really coming up on it here directly. So by 2020, we'd hope we hit it. Not quite, looks like 2022 is gonna be the year. Uh, you can see here on the graph, it kind of started to plateau a little bit towards the end. This is Moore's law, you know, making life harder. So to fight Moore's law, we've been doing things in parallel, as I've said. But it turns out that that's actually been a kind of few quantum steps to keep things going in parallel. Machines were already multi-core for a good while, uh, but the, when the clock speed started to bug down around 2004, and people managed to, uh, engineers managed to keep things improving by throwing in these accelerators. So the first big jump uh, back in the, about 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, was to start including accelerators in the machine. They kind of kept things going. The second boost is one that's happened in... Uh, the uh, uh, past five or six years, which is to make electronic packaging a lot more 3D, something you may not be aware of, actually. A lot of people don't seem to be. Uh, 3D packaging, electronic packaging, has been responsible for making up for Moore's law, not you know, continuing at its normal pace. So we can make things more dense. If we can't make them more dense in two dimensions, we'll make them more dense in three dimensions. Now, this aggravates thermodynamic you know, cooling issues and everything, but trade-offs so far have been good. And so 3D electronics are now part of your cell phone. Your cell phone's got 3D electronic packaging in it. Very important part of GPU design. So 3D electronics have kept things moving along. And we're now really into this third boost that's helping things out, which is silicon photonics, or in other words, moving things towards opto. I've talked already with Dragonfly Networks, moving things away from wired and copper connections to, uh, to optical connections, fiber connections, or even on-chip optical connections. So silicon photonics is an increasingly important part of keeping our our machines moving ahead 
on this, uh, this, you know, this Moore's law kind of curve, even though Moore's law isn't what's responsible for it anymore. So uh, we don't only have, you know, uh, hardware problems to worry about here. We have lots of other constraints that are coming into becoming important as we move on to these bigger machines. I won't go through this list in detail, but I encourage those of you that are really interested in parallel uh, programming to take a look at this list. Uh, this is not just my list. This is a, these are our topics that have been compiled by various exascale guidance committees over the past 10 years as they've been considering what it's going to take to build these machines and make them function properly. They've come up with some uh, very concise and informative uh, constraints that are problematic. And uh, so again, for those of you that think that large scale high performance computing, supercomputing is a big part of your future, it's worth spending a few minutes looking over the kind of concerns that you do want to have uh, that you should be aware of. So the old constraints used to just be how fast is our clock? As I've said, that, that hasn't changed in a long time. Now it's how much power can we get in this thing before it melts? We talked about that. It used to just be flops were how much were we worried about how can we get the most flops, the most computing, most math operations out of our system. Uh, these days, it turns out because things are so parallel and spread out that moving data back and forth is where most of the time is spent on a lot of big code. So our weather code in the 70s, it would have been mostly about how can we make sure that we our CPU does its best job at doing some ads and some divides. And, oh my God, we got a square root here. Or we're going to spend so much time on the square root or this exponential function in our math. And that's where you'd spend time optimizing. Today, you don't care about that. The processors are really good at math. Today, all of your time is spent moving data back and forth. So instead today we say, okay, how can we build a better network so that when Pennsylvania and Maryland have to communicate weather between them, that that communication happens as fast as possible. Uh, concurrency used to just be by adding more nodes. Today, we've got all kinds of things going on. We've got GPUs in the mix, as you saw with some of the biggest machines. We've got a lot of different ways of going parallel, much as by adding more nodes. Uh, memory uh, is, is becoming uh, harder and harder to, it's not scaling as fast as the, as the number crunching is scaling. So keeping data in the right place is more important. So anyway, I said I wouldn't go through the whole list in detail and then I started to do it. Point is that you can go through these bullet points yourself if you're interested in this kind of stuff and I'd be glad to discuss any questions. But the end of Moore's law uh, isn't you know, just the, the, the end of computing, uh, at least we shouldn't perceive it that way because before integrated circuits, there were uh, huge advances in computing. The foundations of modern computing were laid down well in advance of integrated circuits or Moore's law. So we've been stuck in this, uh, this architecture for a long time right now with a, what's called a von Neumann computer architecture. Think of this as just a normal CPU. You've got a CPU and some memory attached to it. The CPU's got the registers, you got the memory, grab stuff, put them in the registers, do math operations, write your data back to memory, right? That's the normal computer that we've all grown to know and love today. And so that architecture for the past 50 plus years has been done in CMOS, that's, a, that's the current kind of uh, silicon electronics basically. So the current generation of silicon integrated circuit and the current architecture, normal computer architecture, has dominated for a long time. But now with Moore's law, we're hoping that we can find, coming to an end, we're hoping we can find some ways beyond this. So there are lots and lots of laboratory uh, technologies right now to move beyond silicon CMOS electronics, things like graphene-based uh, electronics. Uh, so lots of different things. I, I won't go into a list of them because none of them are really at the fabrication stage right now. So they're more topics for scientific articles than they are for uh, you know concerns for you if you're building a machine now or even five years from now. Uh, but lots of people are concerned about how to move beyond uh, the Moore's law limitations and build new electronics with totally different technologies than silicon based. And th there is a lot of progress being made there, but nobody's building a fabrication facility, a plant just yet. Nobody's committed to one just yet. And given that there's usually, you know, when you decide you're gonna start building a plant, you're usually, you know, three years, four years, and tens of billions of dollars these days away from a new, you know, from having a, a chip. Uh, it means none of this is imminent, but there's lots and lots going on. On the other hand, maybe you decide that uh, you want to go with a totally different type of technology. You don't just want to build our computer, current computer architectures. You want to build something that's drastically different. Quantum computing is the highest profile example of this. It's a very exciting area that's got a lot of interest, a lot of funding, a lot of research going on in it. Uh, and quantum computing is a very, very different approach. It's certainly not a von Neumann computer. It's a very different way of, of doing computing and it uses very different hardware uh, of, of various completely different types. Um, and so uh, from, from cryogenic to room temperature stuff, from photons, spintronics to, to ion-based computers. So it's very, very different 
uh, approaches to doing computing, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, it is, I'll come back to that in a second, it's a, a very controversial area of computing. Uh, and the, the last area I think is really important and, and still it, it does have a lot of activity is trying to do something that uses or leverages our current expertise with silicon electronics because we're so good at this, but build something with a very, very different architecture. And neuromorphic computer, or building computers that look a lot like neurons or the human brain or, or any kind of brain, for example, is a good example of, uh, of that kind of thinking. So this is driven, neuromorphic in particular, is driven by the great success that we've had with AI and machine learning in the past 15 years. Neural nets, deep learning have taken over uh, huge areas of computer science applications. It's something we go into great detail with our big data workshops. Uh, and because of that success, people are saying, why don't we just build the, the, instead of trying to make our CPUs run these neural nets, why don't we just build electronics to run neural nets? And indeed, there's been a lot of movement in that direction uh, with great success. So the idea, again, we're going to leverage our fantastic expertise in building silicon-based uh, transistors, and we're going to instead build things that don't look at all like a von Neumann computer, but instead look like something drastically different. Now, these areas are both so rapidly moving. If you're interested in them, I encourage you to catch up uh, uh, with, well, I could just say just read Wikipedia articles or something, but I'll give you a couple of resources here I think are particularly good if you're interested but a newcomer to the field. In particular, in quantum computing, because it's so controversial, uh, it's bizarrely controversial. Never have I seen a subject area where renowned experts, respected experts, differ so greatly in their prognosis for the field. You can find people in quantum computing that are well respected and well regarded uh, and are doing the research that think that quantum computing is going to have a commercial, serious everyday impact in a two to three year time frame. You can also find people that are well-respected, well-regarded, doing research in the field at the same conferences as these people who are saying quantum computing is at least 15 years away because of mostly quantum noise issues, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is very confusing, right? When the experts have such drastic differences. Uh, and I, one resource that I, I find particularly illuminating is the National Academy of Sciences did a report. It's now two or three years old, but it's still very relevant, I can assure you. Uh, that covered a lot of those issues and explains why, you know, why there is this divergence of, uh, of opinion. Uh, so if you're interested in quantum computing, that's a great way to go. If you're interested in neuromorphic computing, there are lots and lots of great things happening these days. As a matter of fact, right here at PSC, we have a Cerebris, uh, which is um, our, our, our local machine called Neocortex, which is the implementation of this machine with 1.2 trillion transistors on a single integrated circuit, but arranged to do strictly to do deep learning type of technology. So it's a drastically new circuit, uh, ambitions in circuitry, but it's still using silicon electronics, but it's all dedicated towards doing deep learning, neural nets, basically. Uh, and so this is an example of a commercial technology. We've got one here at, at PSC, and uh, they're on to the second generation right now. Uh, so th this is a drastically uh, uh, evolving field right now, it's neuromorphic computing. Okay, uh, let's see, let's see another question. Supercomputers. Supercomputers device to turn compute bound problems into IO bound problems. Uh, yes, that's not a bad quote at all. Uh, and as I that relates, I guess, to what I was saying about IO, and that is very common thing. It's people who are successful at using the supercomputing computing facilities well find out that the IO, uh, IO becomes the bottleneck. They become IO bound. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the MPI talk tomorrow. The nice thing about MPI is MPI allows you to cope with that, those situations very well. It gives you some control over it instead of being helpless. Okay. Um, by the way, if we uh, if we move beyond these current uh, current technologies, we have to change our paradigm. It shouldn't be a complete shock to us. We've gotten very complacent, and the integrated circuit has reigned now since the uh, early '70s, maybe mid '60s, uh, almost entirely. So we start thinking that's what computing is. But prior to that, computing had gone through phases from mechanical computing with Hollerith cards, relays, mechanical relays, the vacuum tubes, which were the first famous computers that most of you might recognize the names of, Univax and Univax and uh, whatnot, um, and Colossus, all of those machines, and then transistor-based computers, and eventually the integrated circuit took over. But if, if we have to move, Moore's Law does die, and we move on to these other things, again, it's not the first time we've had to do it. And in particular, uh, there's a lot of inspiration to be found uh, by looking at nature, because I mentioned to you early on, one of the first applications I talked about was modeling the human brain. It's an exascale computers hope to be able to model the human brain in real time with uh, uh, at least 20 to 30 megawatts of power. 
And uh, meanwhile, your human brain actually runs on about 20 watts of power. So you can see that there's a, about a nature's about a million times more power efficient in some sense than we are right now. So there's lots and lots of room for improvement. So don't, don't be uh, pessimistic about the future of computing just because Moore's law is, is hitting the wall finally. Now, why you should be really motivated. So I hope this talk has not just given us a lot of terminology we could fall back on as we work through codes this afternoon and tomorrow uh, and a lot of reference points and a lot, a lot of touchstones. But I hope also that you're starting to recognize that parallel computing is absolutely not a fact. Without question, parallel computing is the future it's, it's, and it's the present. Uh, so it's, it's not like, well, the, you know, it'll fall out of favor. There's no alternative. It's being driven by the laws of physics. Uh, so you want to choose the right approach. There are many, as we'll talk about in the outro talk tomorrow, because I didn't want to spend too much time here before we get into actual coding. In the outro talk tomorrow, we'll talk about the fact that there are dozens, literally hundreds of different approaches to parallel programming. So how do you pick one? Well, we'll talk tomorrow about about the alternatives that are out there and how viable they are. But I will assure you right now that MPI is very, very much the dominant way of doing this on all of these machines. And if you look at the exascale roadmaps, for example, I pointed out those projects and they have roadmaps, you'll notice that the machines coming online right now, as well as machines that are still being planned two and three years out, that MPI is the baseline technology for programming those machines. There's always a hope that some new technology will come along and be useful and hopeful, but all of those machines are built with the baseline thing being, hey, MPI is how the vast majority of codes are going to run on day one uh, and probably for the indefinite future. So you're picking the right parallel programming technology here with MPI. So now it's time to go ahead and, and learn these things, but I want to reiterate one more slide. So I hope this makes sense to you. If, this, if these pieces of all the stuff that you, I hope you absorb from this talk, this is the most important, is that you can see that the normal today processors have multiple cores in them and you can program them with something like OpenMP. You could plug in a GPU and program those with some GPU programming language like OpenACC. But the second that you build something that's got more than one node, more than one workstation in your cluster, you know, more than one blade or motherboard in your supercomputer, the second that you want to have more than one node, you're in the world of MPI. 